We're now going to talk about the bivariate normal distribution. We've been talking about Gaussian mixtures, and up to this point we've only had a single uh, variable that we've observed. So we observe some, you know, one variable, p equal to one variable. Uh, now we want to move on to higher dimensions. So we're going to represent if you have multiple p, you know, if you have multiple x's, let's say I measure p variables in each subject, then I need a multivariate distribution, multivariate normal distribution. The best place to start in understanding a multivariate normal distribution is the bivariate normal. So the, the idea is that we're going to um, have each class, con class conditional distribution be, be normal or bivariate normal. And uh, that'll, that'll give us a way of describing each cluster. So the, let's start by just trying to interpret a bivariate normal. Then we'll try to, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get some of the theory that underlies it. The way to think about a bi bivariate normal distribution is that you have five parameters that describe the shape of a of a you know by you know of a, of a bell shaped curve in uh, three dimensions. You know, so it's a picture, you know, x one and x two uh, along a plane, and then the height of this gives the probabilities, and that really looks like a bell. Now um, the five parameters are are you know completely analogous to what we had with the univariates. Remember that a univariate Gaussian is characterized by the mean and standard deviation. Well, these five parameters are going to tell us everything we want to know about that bell. If we look, um, flip ahead two pages, um, there are some contour plots. And so what you want to picture is, this is the x1 axis, this is the x2 axis. X2 axis. This is really a bell. All right? So it's very high here. And then it goes down quite steeply because these contours are close to each other and it flattens out. So this is describing the shape of that, that bivariate distribution. All right, now the five parameters that characterize a bivariate distribution, bivariate normal distribution, are the mean. So the mean tells you the center of this thing. If we flip ahead two pages, all of my examples uh, we're fixed with a mean of 0, 0. So mu1 is the mean in the uh, x1 direction has 0, likewise with the mean in the x2 direction. Now the mean's not terribly interesting to us. Um, I mean, it's, it's very important once, once we start interpreting these. We're going to interpret them just like the way, just the way we did cluster means. However, uh, what's new is really uh, uh, the way we characterize variance. So the variance, we have three, really three parameters. Two variances plus a covariance. And these three numbers uh, describe the shape of this distribution. So let's just uh, get some practice in, in understanding those three numbers and then we'll get to understand why those three numbers tell us that. So let's, let's first learn to interpret it, then we'll, um, we'll learn why this is the case. All right, so I've drawn a variety of these distributions. Here, in the upper left, uh, we have x1 and x2 have equal standard deviations of a half. Um, I've decided to parameterize this in terms of the correlation, rho. Uh, as opposed to the covariance, the um, the the two are um, really just reparameterizations. Uh, so whether we want to think in terms of the cor correlation or the covariance is um, is just a matter of units. Um, so it's more convenient to think in terms of correlations, I think. So we'll 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 do that. All right. The fact that the two variances are equal and the correlation is zero means that we're going to have circular contours. Okay, so the, everything is, uh, you know, this, this is like a symmetrical bell in every direction. We've been calling this a spherical cluster 
in, in the past because it's round. Okay, so um, again, the, uh, the combination of equal standard deviations and a correlation of zero is what makes it round. Now let's keep the correlation zero and we're going to keep the standard deviations equal, but we're going to make them bigger. Okay, so what happens when you make them bigger is that you now have more spread. So think of a, of a distribution that has more spread than over here. This is the, the observations were much more tightly packed around the mean. So this is saying the typical deviation from the mean is about a half. Here the typical deviation from the mean is about, a, is about one. All right, so that's the effect of making sigma bigger is to, you know, make it more dispersed, therefore the contours are further apart. Well, let's keep our correlation as zero. However, I'm going to now relax the equality of the standard deviations. So notice sigma two is now twice as big as sigma one. What's the effect? Well, the way to see this is that there's much more variation in the x2 direction than there is in the x1 direction. So the contours get stretched in this way. So that's what happens when you have unequal standard deviations. Let's now start to um, make rho non-zero. So if you have a correlation of 0.4, I'm now going to have equal standard deviations, but um, you know a non-zero correlation. What you end up with is a, is a you know ellipsoidal set of contours, but it's tilted on the side. Now notice the major axis corresponds to this 45 degree line. The major and minor axes are both on these 45 degree lines, and that's because of the um, uh, because of the equal standard deviations. What happens if we turn up the correlation from 0.4 to say 0.8? Well, what happens is that the uh, ellipsoids get, get longer. All right, and if we let the correlation approach one, these, uh, the ellipsoid would approach this 45 degree line. As we let the correlation go to zero, what do we get? Well, we'd approach this uh, spherical or circular set of contours. The last um, example that I'll show is where you've got both unequal standard deviations and a non-zero correlation. So what you end up with is ellipsoidal contours that are not aligned with either the coordinate axes or with the 45 degree lines. And you know the fact that a correlation is 0.5 indicates fairly, you know, fairly strong association between the two variables. All right, so the, the point, again, is we've got five parameters. These three numbers tell you about the shape. The two means tell you where the center is. Now, I've been making some claims that these were ellipsoidal contours without any real justification, so let's go get some justification for that. The equation of a bivariate normal PDF is as follows. Now, um, let's derive some contours of this. I, I did that on the next page. So, in general, uh, this could be a little bit hard to work with. Let's simplify our life to, to get the gist of what's going on. So let's assume that the mean is zero. So if the mean is zero, um, I don't need to worry about, you know, x minus zero is just x. Okay, so we're gonna center this thing at zero, and I'm also going to assume that I've got a diagonal covariance matrix. So now the diagonal covariance matrix is gonna imply that the correlations are zero. Okay, so these off diagonals are zero. Uh, when does that happen? Well, it only happens when rho is equal to zero. So um, let's just consider this for now. Now we can invert this matrix very easily since it's um, since it's diagonal. So we can just 
find the reciprocals of those elements and we get the inverse. You can check this. If you multiply these two, you'll get the ident identity matrix. Now, what is a contour? So the contour is going to be the set of all points such that the PDF is equal to some constant, let's call it C. Okay, so if you think about contours on a hiking map, well, the contour shows uh, the set of all points with equal elevation. Uh, so we're just doing the same thing here. Where we're going to find all the points where this thing is equal to some constant. So that, that's all we're representing with those, with those um, contours. All right, so let's go solve this. So we, we want to have the set of all points such that the PDF is equal to a constant. Well, this is the first term. Now notice the 1 minus rho, square root of 1 minus rho goes away. Why? Because rho is 0. So this is technically times the square root of 1, which of course is 1. It leaves it unchanged. Um, this is what goes into the exponent. So x transpose times the inverse of the core covariance matrix times x. This is called a quadratic form. Now, I'll leave it as an exercise to work out what this quadratic form is. It turns out that it's just down here. Okay, so we're going to take x1 squared over... All right, well, let's back up for a second. Um, the first thing I'll do to solve this is we'll multiply both sides by 2 pi sigma 1 sigma 2. So I've done that. And the way to think about what's sitting on this right-hand side is it's just um, it's a constant. Now let's take the log of both sides. So we'll take the log of both sides. Then I will multiply both sides by minus 2. So we end up with this quantity. And so think of this as some constant. Now back to my quadratic form. This is a quadratic form. Uh, leave it as an exercise for you to, to try this out. Uh, it turns out that this is just x1 squared over sigma1 squared plus x2 squared over sigma2 squared. Now, we recognize this as the equation of an ellipse for sufficiently small c. So why do I say that? Well, uh, we've got the sum of two non-negative quantities on the right-hand side, so what's on the left-hand side had better be, um, better be positive. So you can't add up two non-negative things and get a negative thing. So when is this thing on the right negative? Well, you got that minus two sitting out in front. So the only way for this thing to be negative is for the quantity of the that we're taking the log of to be less than one. So remember the logs of le of anything less than one are negative. So this whole thing has to be less than one. When does that happen? Well, when c is pretty small. All right. Now, the, the point with all this is uh, we get an ellipse, and this is the, you know, the length of the major axis. If, if this constant on the right were one, Sigma 1 would be the length of one axis. Sigma 2 would be the length of the other axis. Um, if, uh, if what's on the right-hand side is not 1, well, then the axes still maintain this proportion. It's just that the contours get bigger or smaller. And so that's exactly what we saw, for example, here. The length of one axis was, uh, well, you know, a half and the other was one, but then it got multiplied out depending on um, depending on, on the, the particular contour that we wanted to look at. All right, so what I what I've just shown is that um, you know these contours will be ellipses. Um, in the uncorrelated case, when you've got a correlation. Uh, it's the same thing, but we need to know more about we, we have a rotation that we have to worry about at that point, and I don't want to go through that. Um, I just want to kind of get you um, give you the gist of what's going on in this lecture.